Very good afternoon to all of you. Today is the 13th day of ICT sponsored series on values and well being, classical and contemporary Indian philosophical perspectives to celebrate the Indian philosophers day. Today, we have with us Kantakar, program officer. Now, I would like to request Afti Dhat, Professor of Philosophy at University, to deliver welcome address and introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. Today is the 13th day of ICPS sponsored special lecture series on values and well being, classical and contemporary Indian philosophical perspectives. Organized by the Department of Philosophy, Kaji Nudrul University, Asansol, West Bengal, to observe Indian Philosophers' Day 2021. I would like to express my sincere thanks and gratitude to the Indian Council of Philosophical Research for their financial assistance to organize such program. <coughs> Again, I express my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to our today's respected speaker, Dr. Saraj Kantakar, Program Officer, ICPR, for giving his consent to deliver his valuable lecture in this academic program in our department, despite of his busy schedule. Again, I express my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to the Honorable Vice Chancellor of our university, Professor Shadhan Chakraborty. Without his constant support and cooperation, the it, would it wouldn't have been possible for the department to organize such a program. I, on behalf of our department, welcome our respected speaker, Dr. Saraj Kantakar. Dr. Kar was the former professor, School of Buddhist Studies, Philosophy and Comparative Religion, Nalanda University, Rajgir, India. His area of specialization is classical Indian philosophy and especially Buddhism. Dr. Kaur has published several research articles in various prestigious journals. He has also contributed so many chapters in several anthologies. Today, Dr. Kaur will deliver his lecture on ethical values and well-being from the viewpoint of Buddhist ethics. So now may I request Dr. Kurt to come over here to deliver his valuable lecture. Please, sir. Thank you, Apriyata, madam. Uh, I have prepared this lecture uh, for the UG and the PG students. Uh, for the professors and the, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For the, for the professors and the experts, uh, it requires to be added, amended more with more things. Uh, I knew from the schedule that uh, somebody else from IIT Bombay uh, is also giving the same uh, title. So I kept something out of my uh, presentation so that uh, he will cover up that. I knew him some 10 years back and I think that he will cover up and he will, he will complete the parts I deliberately kept out. Today uh, I want to present the, with the slides here. <laughs> Ethical values and well being from the viewpoint of Buddhist ethics. I hope that everybody is well versed about the ethical values and what is well-being. Still, I thought to clarify some points.
regarding what is the indian counterpart means bharatiya counterpart of ethics ethics or moral philosophy is actually uh, taken in this days uh, in such a way that as if in india or in other part of uh, world there is nothing ethical only ethics and moral philosophy was practiced in greece and athens so it is it is most important to understand uh, that we have a better and higher counterpart of ethics or moral philosophy moral or ethic moral comes from latin more and ethic from the greek ethos uh, can be subsumed under niti or achara and dharma in some senses dharma is a wider concept but in some sense moral or ethic comes under dharma and niti and achara directly related to morality or ethics so ethical or morality can be understood as naitikata niti shastra in a limited sense can be called book of morals or rule book and in wider sense it is a voice and a rule of conscience why i say it is the uh, in narrow sense and the wider sense because in the limited or narrow sense niti shastra is written by some people for some time and uh, for some purpose shukra niti sara is a is a book was written for some time and some purpose chanakya niti for some other other purpose and vidura niti are also in some other situation so niti shastra all these niti shastras and there are so many niti shastras even from bhartruhari there is niti satakam so there are niti shastra so many niti shastras they are uh, when we consider about to uh, their composition the purpose of their writing the writers and their time or the the, the society of the uh, of, the, of those uh, writers then we can understand that it is in some limited sense but when it is called uh, uh, when it is a voice of conscience it is not limited in any country in at any time uh, the conscience will say what should be done and what what is right or what is wrong what is good or what is bad at some situation so voice of conscience if we say voice of con niti means voice of conscience then it is wider it is universal sarvakalika sarvasthanika and then achara shastra can be called conduct book because achara achara means conduct or conduct means achara so achara shastra can be called conduct book and dharma shastra as a duty book or duty book for actions and life we have so many dharma shastras and they have uh, codified what we have to do uh, from our childhood to our death even after death also the sakramas after the antyashti the sakram karmas are uh, listed there and uh, it is advised how to perform the vedic rituals from the time of birth marriage child birth and uh, up to the death and after the death so dharma shastras are also the niti shastras and these are the ethical books also the system of niti achara and dharma are better and wider indian counterparts of ethics of greek or moral philosophy of the athens and latin languages the authority of niti who is the authority of niti who is the authority of achara and dharma the authority of niti achara and dharma are inherently internal in universal sense internal means if it is a bias of conscience it is viveka then it is inherently internal if it is internal then it must be universal because universally everywhere in a, at every any time at any place a person is capable to decide to determine what he should do in what what way he should behave and what actions or what duty he has to partake so in if we if say it is voice of conscience it is internal then it is universal it is eternal and if we say that it is external in local sense that means some king some writer some uh, niti shastra vid the judge or court they may decide it they may determine it so in local sense it is a little different it is little limited but in the internal sense it is 
universal. In the local sense also, the, the local authority will decide what is Niti, what is Achara, what is Dharma. He will exercise the conscience. So the bias of conscience also is exercised by the person who is a local ruler, king, or the judge, or the upholder of justice. Why something is Niti, Achara, or Dharma? In consideration of what they are determined. So this is this must be a question in our minds. Why somebody something is niti? Why something is achara and dharma? Why not the other things? The answer is well-being. So the well-being is always connected with the niti, achara, and dharma. Naiti kata I used to double a for uh, apostrophe. Uh, uh, just uh, to utter a, a, to utter a. So wherever it is double a, it should be utter as a, a. So naiti kata is determined by only one yardstick. That is well-being. And well-being can be translated as ahita, kusala, mangala, and also kalyana. So to sum up, ethic or moral is niti, achara, or dharma. And ethical is uh, ethical or moral is naikikata. Achara, dharmikata, and ethical or moral value is well-being. So wherever is the well-being, then the, the the moral value can be understood. If there is no well-being, there is no moral value of that. Applicability of naikikata and ethics of West. Naitikata is Indian and ethics is West. So where they can be applied? In what extent? To compare the applicability, there is Naitikata for long man in an island. Because there is still, because there still is the question of well-being, or Kalyana, Hita, or Kushara, of that person and the others in the island. But for most of Western scholars, there is no ethics for the long man in the island. There are, uh, often it is discussed that if a person is, uh, is confined in, a, in an island in between the sea and there is nobody, no society is there, then there is no question of uh, ethics. Because in that, uh, in, in Western conception, conception, ethics means it is a duty towards the society, duty towards the others in the society. That is why uh, they make it like this. So that means Naitikata, uh, yes, uh, and the, the Naitikata dutifulness uh, is uh, always uh, pertinent to the human being, not the others, human being, society, and others in the society, not the other beings. But uh, in comparison to that, Naitikata, uh, the Indian concept of ethics, it is not like that. It is not confined to the society, not confined to the, uh, uh, confined to the uh, person, uh, human being only. Naitikata means it is a kind of a duty, it is a kind of a vice of conscience, which is uh, conscience, uh, conscience joined with Kalyana or Hita or Kusala, which is, which is for the whole universe, which is for the nature and which is for the other beings, even the, uh, the plants, the vegetable kingdom and the animal kingdom all. Not only vegetable and animal kingdom, but also the ecosystem. So the Panchabhuta also comes under the Naitikata. So our scope of ethics, means Indian scope of ethics, is wider, uh, I think it is widest. There is no other, uh, other uh, versions of ethics in any land that uh, covers that duty of man uh, towards, the uni towards all in the universe. And apart from that, to come to the second point, Naitikata, unlike morality, is not confined to man's duty to the human, but to the whole person. Even if there is only one man, there is nobody else. But still, the man, the, the single man will consider, will think of his own well-being, his own kalyana. And that is why ethics is, uh, ethics is applicable <coughs> to the same person, to the others, and to the whole universe, anybody in this universe. Even nowadays, the applied ethics considers that uh, we are also responsible for the future generation. Even who will take birth after the after 100 years of our death? 
That means we are also considering our ethical duty, our moral duty towards the future generation who are uh, who are not in our scope. So it is all encompassing and universal. Naitikaita is defined by well being of greater extent. In the last page, we have seen that well being well being is the moral value, is the value of Naitikaita. Uh, here, Bharatiya culture, I use Bharatiya instead of Indian. Bharatiya culture emphasizes for a greater number. Emphasizes for a greater number. Bahujala Sukhaya, sir. Bahujala Hitaya, sir. It is if the well being pertains to the greater number in greater extent, then that is that, that have the more uh, moral value, more ethical value, that is more Naitikata. The greater, wider, and adorable is the well being, the better is Naitikata. The value of Naitikata is conditional to the extent of well being. The extents are what, what can be the extents in, in what sense it can be wider or widest? The extents are uh, the space, time, quantity, quality, material. Spiritual, etc. I wrote here who, who was so uh, there is some conception that uh, the space is not limited with our earth only, but there are very other spheres. Uh, the other spheres are uh, understood as who, uh, who is the, the earth is the who, means the earth is who, and the sphere above the earth is who, uh, above that is. Uh, that is Soha, above that is Maha, Jana, Tapa, and Satya. It is understood that the Satya, the, it is called Satya Loka, or it, the, uh, the sphere of Satya, where the great uh, sages uh, stay after their uh, death or Nirvana or Moksha. And the quantity means if he, something is beneficial for the more people, that must be accepted. And the quality is if the qualitative, uh, suppose somebody will give uh, some knowledge and also food. Food is important and knowledge is important. But instead of food, knowledge is more valuable because the quality is more. Because uh, by not getting food once, somebody will not die. But, but not getting knowledge at a time, that knowledge one may miss. So it depends upon the situation. Whereas ethics and measures, conducts and activities as good, bad, or right or wrong, takes up some other alternative standards. For example, utilitarian, pragmatic, and etc. For the so well being or kalyana determines the naitikata, the ethical value, and in the greater extent. We said that if, there is, if we consider like this, there must be relativism. Relativism means somewhere something is more valuable, ethically more ethically valuable, and somewhere something is less ethically valuable. And the same thing, which is less ethically valuable at one point of time, may become more valuable at another time in another situation. So considering this, people may say that there is no constant, no fixed value of something. The value of something, the moral value of something changes at situation, at the context. So contextuality varies. So that is why there are some considerations that there is the relativism regarding regarding the uh, measurement of uh, something is dharma or adharma, something is naitika or anaitika, uh, something is achara or, or, or against it, or durachara. So, uh, yeah, I, I want to say that there is some nothing like uh, non relative nothing like relativism. It is only non relativism of Naitikata in widest consideration. Naitikata is itself wider than the general world morality, in the sense that Naitikata comes from accepting the rules and the concerns for the widest well being. Whereas morality is defined only by the rules ruler, rules uh, within a domain. Suppose there is a some, something a rule. Or morality, morality comes from more, more means practices, conducts, and behavior of the society, which is approved. So that means in our society, in our family, in our locality, something is accepted, approved as good. 
and in some other society, in some other culture, it may not be approved as good. It may not be approved as moral. So the, in this case, morality is uh, uh, morality is relative. But here, we, when we say that we, when we make a constant, one measurement, one yardstick, to me to say that which is the which is the widest well-being, that is the moral. So widest well-being is something which is objective. And taking this objective standards, we can say that Naitikata is never relative. It is always non-relative. In any society, something it is not a descriptive now. So eating, uh, helping others is good or bad, moral or immoral, in some society, some situation will, de will decide. But if we say that, if we give, we do not make some descriptive sense, we make some normative consideration, we make some norm, we make some standard that whatever, whatever contains, whatever action uh, contains widest well-being, that only, that is the more, that is the Naitika. Naitikata consists in the widest well-being. In this sense, we are just uh, uh, codifying, we are making a rule. And uh, this rule is universal. So that is why there is non-relative vision about these things. Then greater and wider Naitikata is preferable by sacrificing the lesser and narrower ones. Bhagavan Krishna chiding Vishwa and Drona for their failure to see the wider Naitikata Whereas the farmer were clinging to their personal Naitikata in forms of vows and debts which are narrow uh, in sense of the Naitikata. Vishnu was the Naitikata, is the role model and is the, after Rama, Bhagavan Rama, Vishnu uh, is considered as the Pravada Purusha, as the Marjada Purusha So, uh, and Vishnu was uh, content, confined and bound by his own vows. And because of his bound by his own vows, he could not see the wider dharma for which Krishna was fighting and the Pandavas were fighting. So that is why Krishna was chiding, Krishna was chiding him that you could not see the wider dharma. You are confined to your own dharma, your own personal dharma. Similarly, Drona was also, uh, also from, uh, confined with his personal uh, considerations, with his personal bondage, with the Dhritarashtra with the Dhritarashtra and the and the states. He could not see which is the right and to take part in the in this in the portions of the rights. So they they daily they are uh, so involved with their personal consideration uh, of the narrower sense of the dharma that they could not see, they could not take part in the wider sense of the dharma in the in the uh, for which Krishna was fighting, Krishna was arguing. Uh, there is some one uh, Sanskrit verse. I made a little changes in this verse. Uh, it says that Kulasyarthe ekam tyajat, kulam tyajat gramasyarthe, gramam janapadasyarthe, atmarthe jagatam atmartham jagatam tyajat. It means suppose there is some situation, just like you may consider that in Mahabharat. Uh, there is some uh, Pandavas are staying in a, in a village, and in that village, one uh, uh, one uh, demon was there, Bakrasura, uh, Bakrasura, and that Bakrasura was demanding that to eat everybody. Otherwise, anybody, uh, one family should send one person put some food to him. So people thought that okay, it is true and it is good, it is better that to sacrifice one person from one family or four, one person, person from one family every day instead of uh, destroying all of us. So they, they used to send one person, sacrifice one person for that demand. So if requirement happens, so in this Niti, this Dharma says that one person can be sacrificed to save the total family. And the family can be sacrificed to save the total village. The village can be sacrificed for, to save the localities, the greater locality. And the whole world, the whole universe can be sacrificed for the Atma. Atma is not the personal Atma. Atma means the universal Atma. Means it is, in a sense, it is a greater truth. Then regarding, after this clarification regarding the morality, and the wider sense of the morality and the well-being as the moral value. Uh, let us come to, uh, yes, I want to take a, a, a little pause. Uh, is there any, any uh, under, 
the misunderstanding or understanding uh, any anybody wants to say something hello hello am i audible yes sir okay sir so is there any question or anything in this should i go on yes sir in between you must uh, you people may say something somebody may make some interaction so that it will be otherwise it will be boring uh, because of one sidedness uh, and for a long time if you listen others uh, it is not uh, it is not good for the mental health so that is why in between let us have interaction uh, in some sections i shall complete and that's all first take a pause and uh, i seek some interaction so let us come to the buddhist point of view what is buddhist point of view <clears throat> buddha has so many uh, so buddha has discovered so many truths uh, has been enlightened in many aspects which we cannot measure we cannot uh, think of even and that is why i kept three dots three dots means it is eternal it is universal and uncompassable by our limited thought but there are something which we always are familiar and we always discuss about that and those are uh, yeah, very important things those are the sansara um sansara means uh, sansara is defined the always that a samsara ki sansara or it's a, another alternative is jagat jangat sati di jagat so whatever is surpasses whatever is changes whatever is continuing with incessant changes samsara ki going on that is sansara so when it is called sansara it means it is anitya everything phenomenal here is anitya anitya means they are changing and if anitya then it, there is there is no uh, no principle nothing in the phenomena which is called constant and at that time it was thought at the time of buddha it was thought that there is something constant principle that is called atma and that is why buddha when buddha said that everything is anitya in phenomena then he said that everything is in phenomena on atma there is no constant principle people uh, more of on take uh, take this uh, atma uh, in this uh, anatma from this context and they take up that actually buddha said buddha denied the existence of atma buddha denied the existence of atma that is in other context buddha denied or accepted in what sense denied in what sense accepted in other context but when it is in sansara is anitya anatma and dukha so when this this particular sentence is there in this sentence anatma means uh, not actually atma anatma means nothing constant nothing unchangeable the principle there is nothing which is uh, which stands for the principle of constancy or unchangeability so in this sentence we should not bring the atma what is we say soul in, in this regard and then which, when it is anitya and anatma then it is dukkha why it is dukkha everything changing may not be called dukkha one may argue like this because there are so many things which changes which does not exist be gives it sukha for example if somebody will go uh, and meet his girlfriend or boyfriend and attacks for some time 
for some time it will be it will be uh, it will be switch the after some days some years the bo both cannot uh, sit together and talk for more time that means which is the anitya which is anatma is also sukha suppose somebody takes some uh, ice cream and ice cream is he likes ice cream a child likes ice cream and he takes up the ice cream and ice cream will not be finished ice cream will not change ice cream will be like that uh, like a, a, a stone like a diamond piece of diamond and the person will lick on that the child will lick, lick the lick on the ice cream the ice cream will not change ice cream will not finish up then do you think that the child will release it the child will not release if he if he does not after some time what happens he will lose his interest he will throw the ice cream and go so change change and non constancy also gives sukha but here the dukha is said in in a different sense it is not in the sansarik sukha dukha when it is said dukha dukha means in the atyantik dukha with this atyantik dukha this atyantik dukha encompasses both our pleasure and happiness this atyantik dukha called sorrow it is not happiness or unhappiness this dukha cannot be translated as happiness or that cannot be translated as unhappiness it it should be translated as sorrow and the sorrow within sorrow comes both the happiness and unhappiness unhappiness is directly sorrow happiness is directly indirectly sorrow because that happiness will not stay and you cannot release the same thing your interest will change and that is why those all the things both the pleasure and the pain are called sorrow pleasure and pain which are physical which are changing they both are coming under sorrow and the dukha here is used in the sense of a sorrow so in this sentence sansara is anitya anatma and dukha it should be translated as and many people translated many great people translated and not like you are not uh, unlike uh, the modern uh, scholars uh, it is uh, the uh, the the sansara the world or the universe uh, is um, anitya uh, it is uh, non constant it is changing and it is non constant and it is sarup this is one to be this is one to be one of you it is buddhist point of view and it, before buddha it is not that before buddha nobody was knowing this the same thing was described in many ways in upanishads and other by others because the whole indian philosophy starts from this anicana dukha and everywhere it is there but the thing is buddha emphasized it in such a way that no other scripture no other thinkers emphasize it that is why it is the buddhist view point <coughs> chatur arya satya the second thing is chatur arya satya when he was constantly in meditation then in his realization it appears that there are four truths uh, and the four truths uh, are said this in uh, everything is uh, there is dukha uh, there is the um, dukha samudaya there is the origin of the dukha the origin of the sorrow and there is the way of uh, ending the sorrow and there is the uh, end of the sorrow so the chatur arya satya also buddha describes um, uh, the way it was not described in such a way before him that is why it is called, it is the buddhist view point though the similar things are there in similar other way in other scriptures and other thinkers way view but in buddhist view it is a different dukha dukha samudaya dukha samudaya madha patipat and dukha nidara so this chatur arya satya are also buddhist view and then uh, buddha was uh, uh, emphasizing the sansara chakra the patitta samutpada chakra patitta samutpada i need tamil in uh, 
in some other scriptures uh, in south indian scriptures uh, the same thing is described uh, in uh, sailism and uh, in some other um, uh, religious texts uh, but the, uh, it is buddha patita samupada chakra uh, is uh, interpreted and uh, uh, interpreted in a different way and uh, used in different senses in different uh, by different scholars but originally it was the patita samupada chakra or bhava chakra or sansara chakra and it has 12 uh, 12 uh, first terms jati marana chakra so it is also called the um, jaramrutu chakra and uh, what is the universal thing is one thing causes another thing this is the one existence causes another existence one after another so that we we have the agyana and then from the agyana uh, from the uh, agyana uh, comes the uh, uh, comes the birth and the, and then the uh, so many other things are going on uh, in coming things i shall describe it so uh, and then the uh, uh, the three things here is birth jara and uh, death and rebirth birth death birth jara means old age death and the rebirth so like this it is going on and other things are within this so this says that uh, it is a pasita samupada if you take the subject matter then it is a bhava chakra or sansara chakra if we take it as a principle then it is said the causation that one one thing causes another thing one stage of our existence causes another stage of our existence the further stage of existence so in universal way it is the uh, principle of causation nagarjuna has taken the principle of causation not in the exact strict sense and narrow sense as sansara chakra or patita samupada chakra so this is one of the buddhist view points the buddhist view point is also to understand the human being so the human being uh, was described in different ways by different uh, scholars but buddha described it in the Uh, at the first time as the panchas kanda what are the panchas kanda the panchas kanda is the five aggregates the aggregates are rupa vedana sangya saskar and vigyana rupa stands for the materiality or the principle of materiality and the last thing the vigyana stands for uh, stands for the consciousness so there are two things here first there is the materiality and consciousness this thing has taken from the sankhya that there is prakruti and purusha purusha stands for the principle of consciousness principle of spiritual consciousness and prakruti stands for the principle of materiality <coughs> so rupa why it is called rupa here the rupa means which is experienced which is experienced by the eye and ear actually rupa stands for the picture if you can if you roughly it is translated is a picture but if there is a picture there is some texture there is some color there is some depth so there is geometrical figure so so many things are there so it has taken uh, rupa has the uh, any materiality is there the materiality has taken here as the rupa if you take the uh, today's advance uh, Uh, science then uh, rupa is actually not visible when there is the constant so many rupas are there then it is visible this thing has been developed by the uh, by dharmakirti uh, dharmakirti and dignaga when they say uh, there is something um, there is something that solakshana uh, uh, solakshana means uh, there is something which is cannot be visible by itself which cannot be described by itself it is qualityless but when there is so many then there is some congregation then then there is some changes then it becomes uh, experienceable by eye by our nose or by our skin or something so rupa it is just uh, simply described here rupa and rupa stands for uh, customary you it stands for the materiality so when there is the materiality and the consciousness when the rupa and there is the vigyana then there is the congregation of that when that happens what happens then there is something change happens 
some reaction happens and that reaction is vedana that is the vedana or the senses we get some feelings some experiences so those are the vedana when consciousness and the materiality meets then when there is vedana there are so many different types of vedanas but we 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 derive the mind derives some uh, kind of uh, commonality between them and then it define that and that is that defining characteristics is called sangya so we categorize the, our experiences our feelings to different categories and we define and that, that defining thing is called sangya we have conceptuality which is that that is why sangya is also translated as conceptualization so we conceptualize our experiences our knowledge and categorize them then when we have the conceptualization and such, such experiences those experiences does not remain constantly as said they also changes slowly and makes something reactions within them and that is called saskara suppose i have uh, something i read something somebody will read somewhere and then it, it makes some uh, feelings some understanding and uh, some, some understanding it makes some conceptuality in his mind and then it has some saskara some kind of uh, um, uh, some kind of light in him and then that will that, that light will come up when he will experience the similar things so saskara is responsible for recognition and uh, for the uh, understanding of something else gadamar one of the uh, uh, philosophers uh, Uh, says that if you take up uh, if you take up one uh, one scripture and read it if you take up some scriptures and read it in the beginning when you are when you, before you are reading you have uh, when you see the title of the uh, book then you have uh, we have some kind of idea in your mind oh this book might have something might have contained something and suppose we we start to read this then our view will change a little bit oh this is not something but this is something else then we are going on reading and our view will change our understanding will change like this saskara always changes a little bit but always there is some saskara there is some past residue of our present knowledge the present things present experiences present knowledge present understanding leaves some residue which goes on with us and there is some when it is goes on it writes something in our consciousness and when consciousness takes up some stuff some knowledge that is called vigyana if consciousness is pure that is called pure chitta the pure consciousness but if consciousness is imbued with something consciousness takes up some knowledge it qualified with some knowledge bears some knowledge then that is called vigyana so there are so many knowledges and so many vigyana we say but here constantly with vigyana means vigyana is also a group so there are five groups all groups are changing and five groups are together changing it is a very difficult thing to understand but i am not going for a difficult way so it is that the aggregates in the aggregates there are five things and those five things also are changing within themselves each thing in the five also changing within that within themselves so this is the buddhist view point and the fundamental aspects of personality is understood as chitta and a materiality leading to karma in the sansara when i say that this rupa and vigyana when there is the meeting of rupa and vigyana there is the mixture of rupa and vigyana means materiality and consciousness so there is some something some reaction will happen and that reaction is called karma we always do something karma in a refined sense that we are doing something knowingly and buddha accepts that that is our karma which we do intentionally if there is no intention that is that cannot be qualified as karma this is also the philosophy of action in western uh, in philosophy in western uh, think tank the philosophy of action says that the inadvertent karma the inadvertent action the unintentional action will not be an action proper action proper means something somebody will do intentionally buddha accept this that yes karma is intentional action but that that karma has some effects but there is also some other karma which cannot be qualified as karma but they have some effects 
suppose unknowingly on intentionally we put our our feet uh, we we just uh, uh, put our feet on some uh, hot rod hot iron then our 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 feet will be will burn we put our finger unknowingly on on in fire but our finger will burn because there is reaction reaction okay whether it is not intentionally but it will happen similarly if somebody will kill somebody without any intention without no unknowingly just like a, um, karma has made some killing of some um, uh, uh, some animal uh, uh, unknowingly and that uh, person somebody the owner of that animal the owner of the animal was a calf the owner of the animal curses karma if there could not be any relationship between that the action and the uh, action the action and intention action without intention then karma could not be caused the curse could not work this means if we say if you do it unintentionally that is also one kind of reaction and that is also karma and we, if you do something intentionally then it has it is a serious karma and it has serious effects so action proper and action improper both are accepted in buddhism and in the, and the, um, the chitta or our consciousness is always and constantly getting uh, getting uh, uh, reacted getting affected by those both kind of karma and the both kind of karma makes up our sansara makes up our continuity in the whole world, cosmos we shall discuss a little bit more about that when we go for the samyak karmanta in the arya ashtanga marga <clears throat> there is the responsibility there is the possibility of nirvana of the personality this is this is the buddhist point of view before the before buddha or uh, in other scriptures um, it was uh, described that there is the possibility of nirvana the possibility of moksha or possibility of mukti <clears throat> but it is very difficult it is almost inaccessible but in buddhism buddha says that it is the possibility of nirvana of the personality you may not uh, make the um, you may not make the you may not uh, we may not be able to extinguish the change others change the world change the uh, change the nature but we have to make ourselves extinguished we have to our personality we, it is in our effort it is in our ability to make our personality extinguish evaporate when it will be when our karma our actions our past impressions all will evaporate and it is the nirvana so there is the way for that the buddhist have certain unique perspective yes that before going from this case um i have taken up so many uh, so many important factors of buddhist point of view which are unique to buddhism and uh, it is not described in such a forceful way such a beautiful way as in buddhism so these are these can be uh, we may keep in mind that these are the buddhist point of view and uh, the morality or um, the ethical value of buddhist buddhist ethical value will depend upon these things the buddhists have certain unique perspective the phenomena is anitya anatma and dukha which logically are the eternal character of the phenomena Suppose we say like this. That means the physical and dukkha are the permanent characteristics of the of the phenomena. Phenomena means what happens, what goes on. From here.
getting this background sound and getting distance anybody can say hello sir no sir no sir but i am getting so much of sound here am i audible and understandable yes sir yes sir i don't think that i am understandable <laughs> No, sir. We have already received several questions from our participants, and it is already okay, okay. in the chat box. Okay. Okay. After the lecture, I will. I will. Now we can go on in between. Okay. If you see the perspective, and I see the other two, if this is the fact, if this is the fact that the fact. So that is why the logic thing that is important is that performance. Another thing, due to some plus sense, due to the sense in plus three parts. We have no no way to get away from these things. This is the question. This is the condition of our existence. That when we take up, we are in this situation, and in this situation we have to act. Without action, we cannot remain constant. And when we do our actions, when we do our actions, then the action will generate some impressions, sanskaras, and those sanskaras will make its impressions. In other systems, it is called the uh, prarabdha karma. So fruition is called pravrta. So the action or karma and the impression of the sanskaras and after the sanskaras the pravrta. Pravrta means if the the past action will give its results. If we have done good things, it gives good results. If we have done bad things, it will give the bad results. And so one one's primary duty is to care for actions. And be pure without to registering any action. So what is our duty? If we are we are condemned to be pure, to do our actions, then we have to what to do? We have to take care and be pure without to registering any action. Without to registering the registering any action means we should do some action, but the action will be not write write down anything else in our consciousness. By that, one can stop further impression and further creation of the action. So our sanchita karma will not be created. We will not deposit our karma. Deposit our karma. If you do not deposit our karma, then there is no germination from that karma. Just like by not adding oil, one stops the deepa to continue burning. Suppose we are putting the oil. And the and the deepa I use deepa is the I think in Bengal, West Bengal everybody knows deepa is Sanskrit word and uh, there is no English word for this candle is not the English word so lamp is not of the English the nearer but not exact so deepa uh, in deepa we are adding the oil and the it is deepa is giving the light it is burning. Suppose the oil will be oil will be finished and we shall not put any further oil, then the the deepa will be extinguished, the fire will be extinguished, deepa will not keep on burning. Similarly, we have to take care in such a way that we have not to add our karma, we have not to deposit our karma so that so that at a time like the light like the like the light extinguish, we our personality will extinguish. Our personality will not coming into being. It will not be becoming. Without the action, impression, and fruition, there is no continuity or becoming of the person. Just like without oil, the fire in the lamp extinguishes. Similarly, the personality extinguishes. Just one. Uh, uh, if it's, uh, anybody is looking at the thing, one can understand for this. So the personality here, the oil is the karma. The oil here is the you have. I have taken the candle, um, and the oil is the there is, when the oil is finished. The oil means the wax is finished. Then it is 
extinguished. The fire is extinguished. So the fire is the the fire uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the you see the three things are here. One is the wax. Second is the wick. Wick means that thread in, in between the uh, candle, and there is the fire. So here the wax or the oil stands for our karma and it is saskaras. The wick, the wick or the thread in between the candle stands for the rupa, the materiality, and the and the um, the fire, the flame here stands for our other aspects of our personality, other aspects of our personality. What happens here when the, the wax or the oil finishes, means the karma is finished, the sanchita karma, the saskara is finished, then the wig is there, the material body will be there, the physical body will be there, but the personality will extinguish. And after some time, the physical body will also be melted down in the earth. So the personality gets extinguished when there is no oil. Similarly, personality gets extinguished if there is when there is no karma, no saskaras. Just like the candle, the, la the flame in the candle extinguishes in the lack of the wax or the oil. One picture I want to show here that uh, like the like the raining, the constant raining makes the accumulation of water. You may look at the first picture in the green. In the first picture in the green, it is the constant raining. And uh, raining, because of the raining, there is the ample of water. And the water accumulates. And when the water accumulates, it flows. What it is it stands for this uh, constant raining, the constant rain is our actions and impressions. The constant rain is our actions and impressions. And those are the actions and impressions are getting accumulated. So this is our saskaras. This is our, um, we, I am not discussing the alloy vigyana here because the other speaker will make the alloy discussion of alloy vigyana, but I shall touch it. Okay. So uh, it is getting accumulated. The Our past karmas and saskaras it makes gets accumulated just like a river, much of water. And then our personality is like a river. The river is our personality. The river flows, our personality flows. In the second picture, what happens? In the second picture, you see there is no rain. There is no rain. That means we stop adding our karma and the saskaras. There is no further saskara and karma we are making. What happens? Whatever past thing we have done, whatever you see the whatever water was accumulated before, that is only flowing. Similarly, when we stop adding or depositing our past karma, then whatever already is there, that is getting flowing, getting flowing. And you see the third, third picture, in the third picture all our karma, leaving a little bit, are, are getting evaporated. So our karma will be evaporated, consumed. Karma and saskara will be consumed. Then what will happen if there is no river? Then there is no karma, karma if the water is evaporated, consumed, then there is no river because there is no add of water. There is no constant adding. Similarly, we do not add of our karma, our saskaras, then our personality will evaporate or extinguish. So this is another picture. Buddha used both these things. One is the, the, the deeper lamp and another is the river. Just like the river and the lamp, we can understand this thing. In the lamp example, the karma is in, the oil is our karma. In the river example, the accumulation of water is our karma. When there is no accumulation of karma, no accumulation of water, then our our personality will evaporate just like the evaporation of the river. Uh, I request all that if they are not in the video, uh, they can take some water, they can take some uh, coffee or tea, whatever they want, because you, we are not, uh, they are not visible, so we should not ask, ask them for one cup of tea. So that is why I am, also, whenever I am drinking, I may say that you may also take some water or refreshment.
The Buddhist viewpoint continues. The way to such state is sila. Huh. How to? We have discussed here that we have to stop accumulating our karma. We have to stop accumulating our karma. The way to such state, the way the way to such stopping the accumulation is sila, samadhi, and prajna. By the effort of or toil of one's own, without any external help. This is the Buddhist viewpoint. Before the Buddha, there are some other viewpoints, Vedic viewpoints. They say that it is the nature, it is the God, it is the external. Means they say there are three things there. One is Adi Bhautika, Adi Daivika, and Adhyatmika. Adi Bhautika means the Panchabhuta, the earth, water, fire, air, ether. All these things have its effects through the, the seasons, through the rain, through the hot, everything else. So Adi Bhautika effect is there. Adi Daivika, even if you are not, we are not responsible for something, but something will happen. It is Adi Daivika. It is because of some gods will think God, something, some force of nature will do then. Then it is Adhyatmika. There are something which we will do. It is in our effort we do. So there are three kinds of Dukkha. That Dukkha comes from different sources. Some Dukkhas are there because of the Panchabhuta, that is Bhautika, and some Dukkhas are because of the, uh, the exercises of gods or godliness, and some Dukkhas we create. That is Adhyatmika, Adhyatmika Dukkha. Here, Buddha has eradicated such things. He just says that there is the Prakruti or the Adi Daivika. Do not bother about that. It is like that. It will happen. They do not accept here also that some god or goddess, of course, there is some acceptance that gods and goddesses make some disturbances in person's life. Just like our Jyoti Shastra and other Shastras, our horoscope says that some placement of some uh, some grahas, uh, some planets, placements of planets disturb the personal's personal life. Even if there is some description that uh, when Buddha was going to get the enlightenment, before that there are some gods and goddesses, uh, so many names, uh, they came to uh, distract the Buddha to get the, uh, to get away from his, to get away from his uh, enlightenment, from his sadhana. So there is gods and goddesses accepted. But Buddha here says one thing that whatever may happen, whatever may happen by without any external help, by the sila, samadhi and prajna, we can make our efforts and we can get the nirvana. We can stop our accumulating our past karma. So it is, it is therefore it is called samadhi. To sum up, as the final goal of all the life is nirvana, to sum up, as the final goal of all the life is nirvana, the perspective can be mapped as a nirvanic. That means the Buddhist perspective can be mapped as nirvanic perspective. So Buddhist point of view is a nirvanic point of view. Since the nirvana is achievable by one's own, by one, uh, only foot or srama, the path is called sramanic one. The Buddhist perspective or viewpoint is nirvani or sramanic. So that is the word of sramani. Sramani, sramana, the, the word sramana comes from this srama. Srama means effort, by own effort, by sila samadhi prajna. So that is why it is called sramani. And nirvani means the goal is the nirvana. So the Buddhist viewpoint, to sum up in one sentence, one sentence is the Buddhist viewpoint is nirvani viewpoint, sramani viewpoint, and it is the viewpoint of kalyana. That will come now. The Buddhist perfect well-being and ethics. Since Nirvana is the highest goal in the Buddhism, its perspective of well-being and ethics will be Nirvanic, Nirvana centric. That is, it is spiritual well-being. There are so many types of well-being. Uh, in our material well-being, we may divide that uh, the well-being, uh, the wealth, wealth should be there. The well-being regarding the wealth, well-being regarding the children, well-being regarding our near and dear. Somebody gets good husband, good wife. Somebody gets good children. Somebody gets good uh, job. Somebody gets treated in good way in office or in somewhere. 
to somebody is satisfied with his work culture so there are different types of well being and there are health somebody gets good health so different types of well being somebody has so many uh, opportunity so many property and money so he is not thinking so there are different types of well being and buddhist well being is is not a material well being buddhists are not advise of course they are advising that you should maintain the materiality you should get the prosperous good life but there is no hankering there is no there is no uh, charging the material greatness because there is no end of this that is the greed if you charging this material prosperity more and more you are falling in the in the path of lobha or greed and lobha or greed is binding it will make your bondage it will not let you to get the nirvana that is why if the buddha uh, buddhist perspective is nirvana centric means it has the spiritual well being it is not uh, uh, encouraging for more material well being but of course some material well being will happen when spiritual well being will happen by default <clears throat> however for spiritual well being a few mundane supports in the material aspects of life is also necessary that much of material well being has to be cared for that buddha says which is required most required material accomplishments are necessary for the household those who are in household they need material accomplishments it is avoiding that they can't do anything else even without material a little bit of material accomplishments the spiritual well being will not be possible because one has to eat in order to practice something some penance one has to eat and live one has one needs some shelter one needs some medicine so if he, your body and the other the body and mind will not be in, in good state how somebody will make practice something so buddha has taken the middle path that do not take the extremes take the middle path and uh, but uh, the goal is spiritual well being emphasis here is on the spiritual well being and uh, since this emphasis on the spiritual well being so whatever material needs material accomplishments we need we have to uh, we have to uh, manage them in such a way that it will not disturb our spiritual well being it will be in accordance with and supporting and facilitating our spiritual well being therefore the householder has to care for both the material and the spiritual well being and the monks have only spiritual well being with negligible minimum material well being which also has to be surpassed surpassed means suppose we say that the monks uh, those are practitioners those those, those uh, have uh, taken their shelter in the monastery and they are, they have no family uh, nothing to uh, nothing no responsibility to do for the society and everything else because they have done something and after that they they are they, are, they do not have any responsibility and <coughs> but still <coughs> they have some material some some negligible minimum material well being and for that negligible material well being which is minimum for the living at a time that also has to be perfect that has to be abandoned if somebody becomes an arhata somebody becomes a bodhisattva after that uh, that means he has reached the goal of nirvana and after reaching the goal of nirvana there is no need of material things then he may let himself die sitting in the meditation so that so whatever minimum will be material will be is required that has to be surpassed uh one thing i want to add here is that there is something uh, sorry there is something called bcb when somebody will be uh, spiritually in advanced situation step by step he will he will get some extraordinary power those extraordinary power are also like possessing those extraordinary power are also a material well being and those powers also all those powers one has to forsake one has not to own this and uh, um, think that uh, it is my power and uses it for the material well being one has to abandon that also 
then only he has abandoned everything he has nothing and his personality also there is no karma also for making his body or continuation of his body so he has to forsake everything else for the final nirvana <coughs> then the buddhist perspective in comparison with uh, that of the others so now till now we have understood the buddhist perspective what is nirvana what is pramana which is spiritual well being so this way if we take then what others are also thinking what is others perspective to make a compare to compare with others for clarity the vedanta is and most of the philosophies agree with the buddhism that the phenomena is anitya anatma and dukha and freedom from this is the highest goal so regarding these things all schools agree they all agree with the buddhism that spiritual well being is shreya the concept of shreya and preya in the upanishads says this that spiritual well being is shreya always preferable and is above all the desired material well being or preya so regarding this thing regarding this buddhist view point every other school agree but only the thing is that only one only, only on one point most other schools differ from buddhist perspective others accept a permanent basis of the temporal whereas buddhism conspicuously remain silent on this in order to avoid unnecessary confusion this point has to be understood unnecessary confusion in a, in a later uh, 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 composed of uh, a book called vedanta sara you may see there are different definitions of atma putro vai atma somewhere it is said that putra means he, the descendant the progeny is also atma means he represents the person that is in that sense atma but if you consider that putra atma means in a metaphysical sense there is some some misunderstanding so at the time of buddha the putra vai atma sentence was there and uh, there is atma jivatma and paramatma so many other things are there so there are different versions of atma there are uh, my atma is different from your atma somebody's atma is different from our atma so there are different atmas the jaina has the jainas has the view that the atma has the extent as for the body means the atma of the elephant is great is as great greater as great as the elephant's body and atma of the uh, ant is as smaller as the body of the ant so different versions different understanding of atma of the body and there is no uh, there are no or uh, very less uh, systematic study or understanding or scriptures available to common people and buddha was communicating with the common people and not uh, always with the pandits so for the common people even the pandits make more confusion for the common people they have a very big less understanding of uh, regarding atma or the metaphysical things that is why he remained silent conspicuously on this that whether there is a permanent basis or atma is there or not in the temporal in the latter and in some of some or others uh, of his talks this view comes and people have taken those points and uh, say and uh, interpret that buddha also accepted this permanency in uh, as nirvana nirvana cannot be said impermanent akasa cannot be said impermanent so nirvana and akasa uh, so there is two, two words used in the uh, in the vibhashika that is pratisankhya nirodha apratisankhya nirodha for nirvana they use two things pratisankhya nirodha and apratisankhya pratisankhya nirodha means it means they have nirodha they have obstructed they have blocked their karma they have blocked their karma and they becomes the arhata means a uh, worth to get the nirvana so when they get it when they come to this stage this stage they are it is called aprati um, uh, aprati sankhya nirodha sorry it is called prati sankhya nirodha prati sankhya means by knowledge from the point of view of knowledge from from the point of view of their wisdom their accomplishments they have achieved the state of nirvana but when they will die their body will be destroyed then that will be the apratisankh nirodha that is the actual nirodha that happens whatever whatever little residue of the past karma was there it is finished now 
So it is after this Sankhya means it is not a Nirvana by knowledge, but it is Nirvana itself. It is called Maha Nirvana or Pari Nirvana. So, so just like our Jivan Mukti and Videha Mukti, they have this Aprati Sankhya Nirodha and Aprati Sankhya Nirodha. So, who remains after getting the after, after getting the Pratisankhya Nirodha, after getting the Jivan, Jivan Mukti, who remains there? Who is there? People may say that that is the Atma, that is the pure soul, and that departs from the body when people die. <coughs> Buddha says Buddha also got these things. That this is this also makes some confusion. That is why he was always silent and avoided all the talks regarding the Atma, the concept of soul or Atma. Soul is interpreted a bad letter way, but the concept regarding the Atma. <coughs> Actually, the soul is not also Atma. The soul is the concept from the Christianity, and the concept of soul has a different meaning. But Atma has no different, Atma has something different. When some, uh, somebody dies with the karma and uh, his uh, sanskaras, his personality uh, uh, departs from one body and takes another body. And uh, that is, it is called uh, in Vedanta, it depends, uh, um, it, there are some, something associated with that person. So that is the past karma and uh, his pancha, uh, pancha indriya, uh, his mano buddhi, uh, means Ekadasa Indriya, uh, five Karmatras, five elements, Sukhma elements, and uh, Mano Buddhi, uh, Eka, and the uh, uh, and the Buddhi and Prakriti. So and Karma. So many things goes with that. That is so. But when somebody somebody is we call Atma, Atma is not like that. It is called Jivatma. Soul is Jivatma. But Atma cannot be called to get with all these things. When, you, when all these things will get away, then that is called Atma. And that Atma is the universal Atma. That is the Paramatma, we can say. But that universal Atma is not well understood, is not well talked. Even if I say many times, I may, may not speak properly. And if I speak also properly sometimes, little bit properly, then also the listeners have some doubts. Because on this subject, a teacher and a student should, listen, should sit together and discuss for a long time and then only things will be clear. That is why the term Upanishad, the teacher and the student taking, sitting together and uh, speaking or deliberating on the secret matter of the knowledge, then things will be clear. Unless there is the longer things and not only discussion, one has to practice some meditation to understand it. Daily, ponder over it and make meditation on these things, then it will happen. So people have no time to do these things. They just ask, they just come to Buddha and ask whether there is Atma or not. In your philosophy, whether you accept Atma or not. So since the term Atma has many meanings, many uses, and what this person is thinking in his mind, and what I shall say. So considering all these things, which could make so many confusion, Buddha was remaining silent and avoid. There is no, but only one thing is that in the phenomena, there is nothing constant, everything changes. But there is only thing that there is a basis of unchanging, unchanging basis. If there could not be unchanging basis, then there will be, there will be some logical error. There will be error of uh, chakra dosa, error of circularity, anavastha dosa, and there are so many other doshas. So philosophically and logically, one has to accept some, in, some permanent basis of the impermanent world. But Buddha was remaining silent due to some different things. <coughs> then we have understood till now the perspective, Buddhist perspective. One is the Nirvana perspective and uh, 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 the Sramanic perspective and this is the spiritual well-being that is the Buddhist perspective. This Buddhist point of view of and the basis of ethical value from Buddhist point of view. Now, after understanding the Buddhist point of view, we are coming to the basis of the ethical value. Ethical value we know that it is, that gives the well-being and the spiritual well-being, the spiritual well-being of, of the kind of uh, stopping the karma and getting the nirvana, that is that has the ethical value. Other things doesn't have ethical value. Other actions doesn't have ethical value. Only those actions that lead to nirvana, those practices that lead to nirvana, 
that well being well being is nirvana and that well being is is guaranteed then that action that action or that practice is has ethical value now the ethical value what is the basis of such ethical value the well being makes up the ethical value and the well being is nirvana nirvana centric in this i summarize the previous thing previous discussion uh the well being makes up the ethical value and the well being is in nirvana centric if there is no nirvana centric there is nothing called well being so after this nirvana centricity consists in purifying the personality that is five aggregates panchas kanda from karmic stops they are impressions and the resultant becoming the personality is like a stream of karma and its impressions accumulations of karma makes the stream of personality flow just like i saw i i was showing uh, in the picture of the flow of river and the flame burning flame just like the gradual accumulation of water drops makes the river flow and as evaporation of water drops makes the river disappear the non accumulation of karmic stops in a similar way the non accumulation of karmic stops in consciousness makes the personality disappear purifying is practiced in actions for karma and those actions are different uh, levels mental verbal and physical ones in the beginning there are some rules and regulations to control the physical actions and then the verbal actions and at last to control the mental actions what is the mental action the mental action is to think thinking or conceptuality to conceptualize to think is one fundamental mental action the next action is to feel to desire to want wish so desire want wish is the next action so thinking and a desiring are the fundamental action that is desire is called karma so desirelessness is much emphasized desirelessness is much emphasized in the theravada buddhism so we have to be free from the kamana or kama or the desires but in mahasana buddhism it is not uh, it is not confined to the desirelessness only it also it goes to the extent that it should be the thoughtlessness one has to go to the thoughtlessness not only desirelessness even the thoughtlessness stage to should have, should come in the theravada buddhism both are there but in the theravada scripture different uh, scriptures written in letter the thoughtlessness is not never discussed like, more only the vishuddhi magga where where uh, the buddhists describe uh, their path of meditation they are the they are the um, uh, one stage of meditation where the conceptualization conceptualization is stopped for us to stop conceptualization thoughtlessness the real of thoughtlessness one has to go except that we should give up or accept that uh, context of the meditation no here in the theravada they goes to the thoughtlessness they go to, they go always up to the extent of the desirelessness so the but, but here uh, i may emphasize that buddha buddha, buddha and buddhist has this uh, perspective of both both the things it is the, it is a desirelessness in the beginning and at the last it is the thoughtlessness when thoughtlessness will happen consciousness will remain but without any thought without any creating any thought in in mind without remembering anything then the thought will be pure that is the pure chitta only happens and when pure chitta will be there there will be no karma looking at this thing people say that it is akarma vadi akriya vadi once there in that state there cannot be any kriya that cannot be any karma to remain in that state for long and living the life or dying will make the nirvana of the moksha as it happens in a yogic way so buddha said that it is we have to purify the practice to purify our uh, our actions and our mind, mind will be purified our personality will be purified our karma will be purified sanskara will be purified purified means it will be purer 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 and then it will be finished there will be no residue of that so then the kind of the, and, and when it will be purified our chitta will be purified personal will be purified there is no no residue we get the nirvana 
and when that well being happens, that, that will happen, that is the well being. Well being is not that thinking of or reading of many things. Well being is stopping the mind to think. But that is a different level. Initially, we have to read and do something to go to the highest level. The kind of next, the kind and mode of actions and minds, the kind and kind and mode of actions and minds which uh, leads to purification has positive ethical value. Kushala karma and kushala chitta. If you do good things, good, first of all, there are two types of things. The kusala and akusala. Akusala means in, in Bengal, everybody knows that word akusala. Akusala means something bad, something wrong. So killing, making hingsa, uh, and uh, doing some harm to some other persons, and thinking of um, enmity, all these are akusalas, all are bad things. So first of all, the things we have, we have to stop the bad and uh, keep on in the good. And after that, we have to stop the good also. We have to first make the, uh, stop the akusala and do the kusala karma. And after that, we have to stop also making the kusala karmas. So that our positive karma, our positive ethical value, we have to, dis we have to stop also. Because the results in spiritual well-being and ego and desires and desireless kusala leads to nirvana. So the opposite type of actions and minds that have undersigned, that have uh, undesired effects leads to samsara, leads, to, leads into samsara, has negative ethical well-being. That means the kusala karma, which leads to spiritual well-being, which leads to nirvana, is, has a spiritual well-being, is spiritual ethical value, and uh, which leads to the samsara, which has a negative ethical value the negative ethical well-being. There are opposite, there are composite ethical values of actions that produce some nirvana, nirvanic spiritual well-being, some sansarki material well-being and some undesirable effects that cannot be called well-being. This is the most important thing in the ethical value. So we have defined, uh, Buddha has defined this kusala karma and akusala karma, kusala chitta and akusala chitta, but there is some combined kind of things, combined kind of things, uh, and it has both bad and good results. You may one example we may bring from the um, from the uh, from one of the uh, efforts or uh, activities by the by the Mahatma Gandhi. In uh, what happened? To some people are standing uh, around, and in uh, when Mahatma Gandhi was walking, when Mahatma Gandhi went uh, nearer and saw that uh, one uh, cow is cow is there and suffering and uh, inside the cow's belly uh, there is some uh, there is a calf new calf and the calf's uh, calf's leg comes out of the uh, the the cow's belly in the middle of the belly the cow's the calf's uh, feet comes out generally the calf's feet becomes very sharp and the sharp uh, cow's feet, uh, calf's feet, um, deciphered this uh, belly of the cow and comes out. And because of that, the calf is not getting getting bath and the cow is getting suffering. One intelligent person happens to be there and he just put some little fire in the calf's leg and the calf has taken the leg inside. And he put again, the calf's leg taken has taken the calf's leg, taken his leg inside. So like this, the leg has gone inside. So when we do this thing, we are doing the good things for the calf and a good thing for the uh, the cow, both the mother and the calf. For a good intention, we are doing. But what operation we are doing? It gives some kind of pain to the calf. So it has the combined value. It has the kusala value and akusala value. Here the akusala chitta will not uh, uh, created. The kusala chitta will be created because because the intention is good, but the action has generated both the values. The action will generate both the both kind of things. Similarly, in another reason, Mahatma Gandhi said that if a cow is getting an in accident and the, it is it is certain that cow will not cow will cow will not uh, recover will not lie, will not uh, live. In that situation, the cow is suffering greatly. It is better to shoot the cow and kill the cow. 
so that the cow will be free from the suffering so this kind of thing our intention is to kill the cow our intention is to to make the cow free from the suffering the physical suffering the pain as he got from the accident but by that we are making the end of the life of the cow so the action has the combined value here it has kusala chitta kusala karma and also little bit of kusala so like this a combined things are there uh, when we do something we do some combined we happen to do something like this buddha has taken the uh, somebody was offering the buddha the some something to eat and buddha knew that it is something it might have something wrong but since it was somebody is offering and buddha could not uh, buddha was begging in the in the way of begging and he could not refuse the begging so he has accepted it in that and buddha got the dysentery diarrhea and uh, died in that so the the thing has akusala and kusala buddha has accepted and he he saved the kusala if he could not accept he would make something and he could live long he has accepted it and his karma has been finished but when he accepted he physically he touched he was getting tortured for this and he died so kusala and akusala the combined when the combined kind of work we do combined kind of result we have to suffer from the then we come to the uh, important thing <coughs> am i listened by anybody or i am the only person speaking and listening no sir i am listening but no nothing will no bias is coming no sir we are all the only for sir sir and listen this uh we think each and every participant is enjoying your lecture enjoying sir you can you can continue and after main, we will mera ye lakshya hai main hindi to keh sakta hu na ha 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 sir hindi ke isliye keh raha hu ki hindi mein hindi mein ke kaha baat hai padhana padhana hai pakana nahi ha 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 main pakana main matlab pakana matlab hindi mein kya hai pakana matlab cooking ke artho mein nahi hai pakana matlab matlab jantrana nahi dena nahi not to give pen so sometimes when uh, somebody speaks your teacher uh, say something sometimes she did say that na padha raha hai ya paka raha hai matlab wo torture kar raha hai so i should not torture at least when speaking when when i should speak and after your lecture we will discuss it ha na whenever you are getting bored or something you may ask something so get in i have i have questions i have some questions i will ask you but after okay. your presentation because uh, at that I'm time i was asking notes, i am taking notes sir each and every okay. time you were saying uh, i am keeping i am keeping I have, a, I, have, I, have a, I have an interest in buddhist philosophy and i am working on it uh, the another speaker sebastian uh, his name i remember now sebastian from iit uh, bombay he will uh, speak on some other things uh, whatever i just uh, i am touching and living and i did not touch also he will sir so uh, my problem is my, my uh, objective is not kisi ko pakana nahi kisi ko torture nahi karna kyunki hum bahut samay mein pak jate hain isliye to and at that time i was asking because i said i finished one uh, one aspect now also i finished another aspect and coming to Uh, in the first se section i i was talking about the uh, naitikata indian sense of naitikata what is dharma naitika achara means the counterpart of the ethics or morals of West, western uh, conception and the second section second section i made this thing that uh, what is the buddhist perspective of ethical value so you know the buddhist perspective is nirvana or samadhi samadhi and the nirvana whatever it leads to nirvana has the way and that is the well being whatever the nirvana ki well being the nirvana ki well being and um, whatever whatever consists the nirvana ki well being cuts our karmic impressions that has the ethical value
and now we are coming to another session <coughs> you may take your coffee without to sharing with others because you are in your home and uh, <coughs> there is facility to do everything else so the initial moments of buddhist ethics now you have understood the buddhist perspective of ethical value understood the what is ethical value in our indian sense and now we are going to say we are going to discuss we are going to deliberate on the initial moments of buddhist ethics <coughs> after enlightenment the buddha was sitting like that for a long time it is said that buddha was sitting uh, in the same place for 49 days and nights before getting enlightenment and he got the enlightenment <coughs> but after enlightenment also he was sitting in the same stage same pose for some more some more some more times not for days or one or two days where in what state he was dwelling in what state he was there sitting for a long time he was dwelling in chatur brahma viharas we chatur brahma viharas are always counted from the down maitri karuna mudita upeksha my from always down i wrote the four chatur brahma viharas from maitri karuna mudita upeksha in this state he was he was sitting there but actually this state happens from the beginning from the opposite direction it is of course it is called maitri karuna mudita upeksha chatur brahma viharas but actually it starts from different order it is upeksha mudita karuna maitri he was sitting in the enlightenment state in a joyful state in a success state huh? and uh, he was uh, actually having two things act together one is upeksha and another is mudita the mudita is that state mudita describes that state the mudita the word mudita actually is used to describe uh, when uh, the sun when the sun rises and you know when the sun rises the lotus a uh, lotus is closed in the night and a lotus sta start to bloom blooming the lotus start to blooming so when the lotus starts to blooming uh, when the sun rises lotus starts to blooming that starting of that blooming is called mudita <coughs> in in ordinary language mudita is to see but here the mudita is to open it is opening it is just a smile that is why mudita also used for smile a light smile a little smile when the when the uh, two um, was the uh, lips the two lips are parting away uh, and the teeth looks a little bit teeth looks a little bit and the uh, lips are parting away in our face that is called mudita in the smile starting of a smile a light smile so when buddha was sitting with a joyful state he was sitting with this smile the the mudita state the mudita is physical mudita is mental in the mental state was mudita his total being was just enlightened and vibrated with this, some kind of joy we call it ananda in a, in a upanishad it is called ananda but here it is called the mudita so in mudita state he was there and when he was there it is not that the, he was not feeling the external things the sense experiences he was sitting for a long time so there might be some pain some hair or something some insects so those things he was avoiding he was just uh, avoiding that avoiding is upeksha upeksha matlab not to give mind to that just undermine that okay let them let them, let it go let it go so he was letting it go the other physical and other, other things experiences and he was there in the joyful state and when he was in joyful state he uh, he the two things happens in, in his heart one is a karuna karuna means the compassion for others he was experiencing the outside world and he was experiencing himself it is a is a kind of experience if you have experiences sometimes that uh, um uh, that uh, when somebody is going to somebody is going inside his uh, to uh, after marriage there is some day where the the bride and the bridegroom meets first time when the bride and bridegroom meets first time 
when the bride groom uh, naturally normally bride groom is kept uh, before in that room and the bride is, the bride is kept before in that room and the bride groom has to go inside the room so when the bride groom goes inside the room so he has some different type of a situation so if he 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 is he has he is in a satisfied marriage he married to a good person then he will be in a mudita state that state is a kind of mudita state a, a happy state and in that happy state joyful state he may have he may think that oh my brother or my friend was in the dissatisfied marriage and he may think of some kind of anukampa some kind of karuna compassion towards his brother or his friend who has dissatisfied marriage when he, when he is thinking his satisfaction he is feeling his satisfaction at that time he may think others dissatisfaction it happens naturally so karuna happens in the buddha's heart because that heart is not the individual heart at that time the, it is universal heart he was feeling himself and feeling others everybody it is described in the uh, pali uh, pali literature that uh, that light comes from buddha's mind buddha's forehead and light enlightens the realm in the cosmos so the the meaning is the symbolic meaning is in that light means he experienced he realized the whole universe the good and bad everything else and when the people are suffering he was he himself is getting delivered getting liberated getting nirvana getting arhat state and others are in the difficulty others are uh, in the situation of uh, misery and that makes the karuna the anukampa for others and when the karuna or anukampa for others rises in heart then what happens can you keep your uh, then that becomes that person becomes a maitri that becomes because that person becomes loving friend friendship loving friendship or friendly love so he becomes mitra he becomes mitra he becomes friend to others the maitri the friendliness towards the others comes in his heart these two four brahma viharas he realized he was dwelling in that four, four brahma viharas for a long time upeksha mudita karuna and maitri then after that after some time then he the buddha rose from enlightenment and stood up looked around and the others he could instantly distinguish his state of being his state of being means his state of being is nirvana and the other state of being he realized also the other state of being is they are in the sansara others are in the sansara i am in the nirvana others are like me others are toiling life after life in the miserable condition of taking bath living in a miserable or happy or unhappy condition and then jara roga mrutyu and then again taking bath again and again this cycle is going and people are suffering from that there is no freedom from this cycle of death and birth and misery of sansara but he has got this way he has been freedom he has got freed from this this bond this near so when he comparing instantly he was distinguishing then the, the the incessant toil the multitude of mortals from insects to the humans suffering from life to life grinded to primeval sorrow atyantik dukha and no escape he could realize these things when he stood up he, he was thinking he was he was looking this thing he was experiencing this thing when he was sitting and that is a corona and maitri kept and when he stood up and observed in his eye the same thing he saw then he one exclam exclamation exclamation in his heart oh no the buddha's heart was filled with compassion anukampa he could he could not move somebody when he struck with anukampa one may not move karuna and anukampa are the similar kind of things but karuna is your melted heart and anukampa is the heart that uh, touches others with some softness the first step when he was uh, he was dwelling in the four uh, chatur brahma viharas why it is called brahma vihara one question you may ask 
it is brahma vihara the term brahma is used in the highest sense not always regarding in the sense the brahma uh, brahma means the brahma in upanishads or the brahma means brahma of course he he gives some upadesha here he states that brahma and other gods and goddesses doing dwelling somewhere but here brahma vihara means the greatest happiest the inside meaning of this thing we shall not talk now but the outside this thing brahma is highest highest state that is just like brahma word also used for highest ultimate after that nothing is there so symbolically the chatur brahma vihara is the ultimate state the highest state nothing is above that nothing apart from that so this is the enlightenment in the consciousness this state is the enlightenment of consciousness and then when he looked at, he 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 rose up from his seat and and looking at everywhere observing then this becomes the perception he he perceived he was perceiving that others and then he he comes with the vision the vision that the mundan and metaphysical that there is this people are in the sansar and i am in the nirvana that is the vision he has and then here vision is not only poetic sense of vision a vision just it is he has the normal vision normal understanding normal perception then he could when he was uh, he was feeling very greatly uh, as i wrote in the third paragraph in the blue in the green so his concerns for well being of others happens so if this is a this is a, he is in his concern in his consciousness he, he in his consciousness there is a part of that called conscience huh? we have the we have the conscience where he was feeling of the well being of others feeling for the well being for others and that makes the that feeling the well being of others is compassion <laughs> then that uh, initial moments of buddhist ethic starts and uh, first what happens here here is the uh, karuna and maitri starts and after the karuna and maitri the uh, compassion comes and this is the initial moments karuna maitri and compassion these are the first three things or you can say karuna and compassion are similar and that is why these are the karuna compassion in one and maitri another these two things are the first initial moments of buddhist ethics buddhism starts from here <clears throat> he dwelt in his thought when he was standing he was in that thought he dwelt in his thought as he achieved the freedom from the sorrow what is the worth uh, to himself what is worth uh, to himself and the best the way to escape but what about these hapless and helpless beings so this deliberation he was continuing from the enlightened cave of his tender heart flew selfless emotion takes a step of his duty to enable others to end their primal rudders of sorrow authentic dukkha to dis- distribute his experience his upalabdhi the way to get it and to end the sorrow to the way to get the experience and to end the sorrow this makes up his course of action the mission for the rest of his life the great resolve on ethical value and well being he was still standing <clears throat> and to the right side i made that the first thing when he was thinking of it was deliberation it was the moral deliberation it is not a, a epistemic deliberation it is not a metaphysical deliberation it is a deliberation it is called ethical deliberation and then in the second stage it comes compassion for the well being is the initial point of buddhist ethics when the deliberation start deliberation happens after that compassion is the well being the compassion for well being of others is the initial point of buddhist ethics and setting the duty buddha said his duty that his mission is the middle of the buddhist ethics and a way of action completes one of the important initial points of buddhist ethics so the initial initiation of buddhist ethics comes with these things the feeling of karuna maitri compassion and feeling the feeling the compassion for the well being of others in a nirvanic way and setting the duty that it is our mission to lead others in the in our dharma way and then then 
um, the way this uh, the uh, dukkha uh, the 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 way of sadhana the way of uh, practices that will end the dukkha that will lead to nirvana makes the duty so total these things if you say that it is the achara it is the duty and uh, it is the niti all these things comes here <laughs> The Buddha was still standing, evaluating his duty and the course of action for others' freedom. When two merchants passing nearby road with goods, nearby road, nearby road with goods saw him, out of generosity and honor to a mendicant, they offered a bowl, which the Buddha took, stretching his hands. They put another and then another, seven bowls and some food therein. You, the story you, uh, everybody knows that the um, uh, two merchants, uh, uh, their name I forgot, uh, Ballika, uh, the name I forgot when I remember I shall say, those are they are passing the Indue and they, when they saw Buddha standing, so they wanted to offer the food, but Buddha has nothing, so they offered a bowl and then when Buddha has taken the bowl, they put a uh, seven bowls one after another and then they kept the food why the seven bowls there are some symbolic things in the in the in the other context we may discuss but here it doesn't fit <coughs> the buddha gave them his sweet blessing so when buddha has taken the food but he has to give something so he gave them the sweet blessed such sweet blessed such advice how to get rid from the incessant sorrowful life while doing daily business so they were the they were the first students they were the first students first followers uh, uh, of the buddha <coughs> so the two merchants and their followers went on preaching the buddha's message wherever they made business so the starting the mission the buddha was thinking it started now <coughs> The first stage when he was, uh, it is mendicant's livelihood, when he has uh, he has taken the bowels and the food, that determines how a person, how, how the followers of the Buddha or how he will live. So his livelihood is to beg the food when he required. So the live livelihood of the Buddhists, livelihood for the Buddhist yarn set here, set here in this example that we have to take the livelihood by begging, not by yearning. And then the third thing is morals for spiritual well-being. The goal is mundane play. When we are in the mundane play, the business people, those who are going in to do business, the merchants, they will do their business, the mundane activity. But the goal will be not only mundane activity to get the profit in the business, but to get nearer to the nirvana by curtailing or cancelling or gradually diminishing their karmic effects then compassionate duty to society and that is the when they are going to preach others that is the compassionate duty to the society so buddhist ethics these are also part of the initial moments of buddhist ethics <coughs> the buddha recalled then buddha was standing there and the Buddha might have taken the food, the merchants have taken, given him, merchants have offered the him, and the merchants have gone. And after that, Buddha recalled the sorrowful effort of his past companions in Sarnath before going to, before Buddha going to Uruvela in the Gaya to make the penance. He was practicing for six years with his friends, with the other co sadhakas, and they are the, in the Sarnath. So he recalled that and started his journey to share his way of enlightenment to them. He reached there, looking at him from a distance. Those six people exclaimed, they uttered, thus coming. So in Sanskrit, they talk the Tathagata, means thus going, thus coming, means see, the, he is coming, Tathagata. So this, is, this becomes the name of the Tathagata after that. And it has some symbolic meaning. Tathagata, like that he is coming. <clears throat> the Buddha reached nearer and proclaimed that he is a Sambuddha. 
when Buddha went nearer, he said that I am not coming like this. Just I went. I am coming with the Aja some Buddha. Now I am something different. Then they prostrated before the Buddha. When Buddha said this, they know that Buddha will not say the false thing. Huh? They will, Buddha will not say that he is a professor when he is not. So he is saying he is some Buddha means he has awakened. Some Buddha means awakened, perfectly awakened. He is perfectly awakened now. Then the, those six um, two fellows, they prostrated before the Buddha and gave him honorable seat and listened his words of dharma. So that becomes the dharma chakra pravartana. We have no historic things, no relevance of the historic things, but we have to go the historic things, how the ethical values and the well-being, ethical moral well-being has gone with these things Buddha's ways. The Buddha then roamed place to place. After that, Buddha roamed place to place for his life, selfless duty, and people get attracted and get decent and listen to Buddha and discuss and advised and Buddha advised them. The compassionate duty to society happens when Buddha went to uh, the students, uh, his friends, and to, uh, to and roam place to place to teach his dharma. So this is the compassionate duty to the society. Setting the sex actions of the mendicants. So when he also made this, that this is the duty of the mendicant who will follow me, that they will also preach my dharma, whatever dharma I am telling to others. So whatever he he he, take, he has taken his as his duty the same is also duty of his powers <clears throat> as the buddha kept up his selfless mission more and more people met him and took the advice they become the upasakas some joined him some followed and lived like him with rigorous sadhana and carried out his mission they make up a Sangha. So the Upasakas and the Sangha, this Upasaka means those who will be householder, in English we say lady, and but follow the Dharma as far as possible. And the, those, who, those people who followed the Buddha, who remained with him, who made these rigorous uh, practices, they become the, they form the Sangha. Sangha means the group. The advice and moral conducts given to Upasakas are for both mundane and spiritual well-being. <clears throat> Initially, well-being is seen bifurcated, spiritual and material. Actually, for the upasakas, for the householders, they have two aspects, the mundane aspect of life and the spiritual aspect. The mundane aspect is how to get, how to get, earn money and feed the children, have the children, feed the children, get them educated and, uh, and able. These are the mundane aspects. And the spiritual aspect is that they have not to amass, not to store so many bad karmas or good karmas which will make their, which will become the cause of their becoming. So the, both the things they have to take care. So initially, well-being is seen by perfect, spiritual and material. But actually they are, uh, they are one. With the material things, spiritual will happen. Because if there is no body, no, no money, nothing, then how, how dana and other karma will happen? So one has to have some little bit minimum material things. And when it happens, the goal is the spiritual things, to make the, some good things, some generosity to others. Morals, we are looked in three ways, as connected for material well-being, for spiritual well-being, and for both material and spiritual well-being. So morals here are for both the for three, three aspects here. Morals were practiced in an integrated way, both for material and spiritual well-being. This has integrated the, the word has been emphasized by Sri Aravinda. But before that also, it is it is combined, it may be combined as it holistically, we may say that uh, yeah, the, both the things, the material and well-being, we are taking together at the same time keeping the balance between them and the keeping the goal, the spiritual as the goal and the material as the means for that. <clears throat> so that is why it's the integrated way, avoiding the extremes and adapting the middle path where the motto. It is the Buddha's point of view that do not get to the extremes. Before he was practicing the penance in the extreme way and um, after that uh, when Sujata offered 
he could not get the enlightenment and so his body was getting one away means getting destroyed sujata one girl there offered some food and then then he understood that when the body and mind is okay then something will happen something otherwise if body and mind will be destroyed then how how the enlightenment will happen so the extreme things extreme penance is abundance the middle your path he has taken and he also taught the middle path he emphasized the middle path first time in the indian recorded history on recorded history we do not know in the beginning spiritual remain introductory or secondary and qualifying the material and the pro and progressively the order reversed when a, when, a, when, a, when a person the upasaka the, the householder goes to buddha buddha may say that okay you do your household things household chores but do the spiritual things spiritually you do the things not do the in a, in the normal way without being understanding the karma's effect now you understood the effect of the karma the how the karma binds you after the um, birth and rebirth and death so now you do such karma in such a way you do the karma you qualify your karma with the nirvanic value with the well being of uh, spiritual value then your karma will be will be better with kusala karma it will be kusala karma so first time in, in the initial stage spirituality remains qualifying the material but when he becomes established in that slowly the spiritual becomes primary and the material becomes secondary for example when a new um, daughter in law bahu or badhu badhu comes to the uh, home uh, and uh, there is the sas is there the mother in law is there daughter in law comes mother in law is there daughter in law is helpful secondary to the mother in law but uh, at last when the time goes by this daughter in law becomes primary mother in law becomes old and secondary or tertiary or non non so the um, the household is taken in charge in the beginning the mother in law takes the charges of house and towards the end the mother in law becomes non and the daughter in law the daughter in law becomes a house at that time the mother in law sas bhi kabhi bahu tha wo bahu sas ban gaya and then the sas old becomes older oldest or dead nothing similarly first material first spiritual becomes as badhu you are, you take this spirituality as badhu and then keep your materiality as your mother in law at the sas and towards the uh, at the time passes by this spiritual the badhu becomes the secondary and the mother in law passes away the materiality has gone so this way the progress happens living a life life like this made the buddhism a religion and the panchasila was advised as the spirituality for which the materiality we will go for panchasila in the next batch so this way we have to take the buddhist ethics i think my time is over it was required for sorry it was required for some followers to remain in a place and make special practices as the buddha did it created the arama when the sangha created the arama is created all were advised for cutting this snare of sansara by sila samadhi and pragya with the utmost care in thought action and speech the inmates of the sangha used to take up only the spiritual well being as they sacrificed the material well being for themselves they were bound with rigorous morals as inevitable for their spiritual developments however for social reciprocity however for social reciprocity they care for others and for them acquired the domains of knowledge like ayurveda jyotirveda that are inevitable for material well being so the buddhist samanas they they have taken care of some material well being and studied ayurveda jyotirveda etc to help others sila samadhi and pragya were are elaborated as arya ashtanga marga all of them all of them means the samana and the um, household people the the uh, samana and the upasakas all of them have nirvanic ethical value 
in the sense that this lead to the highest well being which is nirvana the pantashilas are described you many people have knows this thing so i should not i observe or refraining i observe refraining from killing any living beings i observe refraining from taking what does the owner not give me observe i observe refraining from committing sexual misconduct i observe refraining from telling lies i observe refraining from taking any intoxication or drug so most of the things such ahimsa first is ahimsa not killing any living beings and the second is the uh, refraining from taking it is asteyam ahimsa asteyam and sexual misconduct it is uh, brahmacharyam and the fourth is satya so in a different ahimsa satya asteya brahmacharya these are ahimsa satya uh, asteya uh, brahmacharya these four are accepted and the fifth was there uh, in the, it is the refraining from taking intoxicating or a drug it is the added thing the five precepts were basically important for the household who could not observe the observances which are more difficult and for the monks the precepts has mundan ethical value but these are of high spiritual values for nirvana the midway of the buddhist ethics so let's stop here should i stop here madam madam ab ji madam If you if you have say something more, sir, you can continue. We have no problem. No, I am coming. Uh, the time is uh, over. After I five, I should speak. No, I am okay. finishing. Okay, I am finishing now. In ten minutes, I am finishing. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, everybody knows the uh, number eight four class, and these are the pragya means which. Uh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. You can continue. Sila samadhi pragya, and uh, this thing we should not discuss. It will take nirvana. nirvana ke thik value from moral from exemplary life of the buddha the red the red part i am telling there are many events and stories elaborated in relation to the buddha's life in all these he practiced the compassion to all for his own action and others action and future course of actions get to the nirvanic well being the main principles of analysis involved in all these cases that are depicting the present or what happened as anitya and dukha and what lies in future and moral life in nirvana the thing is there are some instances i kept here somewhere buddha was harassed and his people his followers were harassed and uh, so one of, one of his brother he joined he is he, he becomes a follower and tried to hurt him and uh, there are some where the women wanted to take part in the aram to take the buddha dharma and uh, where some buddha has gone to angulimala a dreaded criminal and uh, uh, changed him so all these things buddha has made for his uh, with one definition uh, with one intention that well being they should have the spiritual well being and the second thing when he was trying to console them when he was trying to console the other people he was uh, taking up the uh, the help of uh, the concept of anitya and dukha you see what these people are doing fighting for is all anitya and dukha so why you are fighting for these things you leave this so that is why all conflicts all fights fights could be resolved um, um there are two important cases where the buddha was in, uh, interfering with the political and legal matters he mediated and resolved and he an initiation of battle between two states there are i am telling it in a very um, very in a less manner there are, there are two kings one azad satru and pasandi they are going to fight with each other because there is a river in between their kingdom so they were they wanted that uh, the azad satru was telling that uh, the river is mine and the pasandi was telling that uh, river is mine 
So both are claiming their ownership from the river. So that is why the fighting was going on. Buddha was passing by and he, he went to them, say, if you fight, then all people will die. The water is the same. Then why don't you? And that is why it's impermanence. Because you are fighting, it is impermanent. After some days, there will be rain and the river is full of, will be full of water, then should not fight. Whatever water is there, you may share, share with these things so that it will be welling up all. So in this way, he resolved that matter. He has not taken the legal and political things here. In some other cases, uh, so one person was a great criminal and he was going to get uh, death punishment. But he came to Buddha and surrendered. Buddha gave him the assurance for his life. And then the king listened to him. King was the Satru. He came to him and said, he was the criminal of the state. You should not give him this, he should not surrender to you. We have to give him the, uh, in, uh, the death capital punishment. So Buddha said that if you give death punishment, what will happen? He will die. So he, everybody is dying. So rather I am giving him the surrender and he is taking the path of dharma. He is doing good things for others. So what is the thing? If you want to keep, kill his body or kill his mind, I have already killed his bad mind. And he has a good mind now. He has good personality now. Then why do you want to kill his body? So the king has the king has understood these things. So this way, he is resolving the conflict, resolving the political and legal matters, incorporating, uh, initiating the, his points, his spiritual points and the spiritual well-being has been successful. And a drop of ethical value in Dham, Dhammapada. Dhammapada is a book you know, everybody knows, that it has the, it is the moral book. It is the book of morals, Niti Sastra of the Buddhism. And one thing is how to conquer the bad things in us. Conquering the anger by non-anger in the opposite way. The method is here the opposite way. Conquering the anger by non-anger, conquering the evil by good, conquering the stingy by giving, conquering the liar by the truth. So how to mitigate the bad things? So we have to we have to we have to instill in us the good things which is opposite to the bad things, so that the bad things will happen. So one verse is there, let a man put any anger, let him renounce pride, let him get beyond all worldly attachments, no suffering befall him who is not attached to name and form. If you are not attached to phenomenal world, then it, nothing will happen. Who, will, who calls nothing his own? The Buddhist ethical value here consists only in the inherent kalyana of the person the purity of personality and the mind so that the karma will be pure and will not generate the binding factors for future becoming. To cuddle karma and escape rebirth by nirvana. In all the opposites, it is clarified that the core of the ethical value and well-being from the Buddhist point of view consists in the felicitation of nirvana. The ultimate way to extinguish one individual stream of personality. This is the unique approach of the Buddhists to end the primordial suffering. The truth is that the karma in the form of a thought, speech and a physical form, physical effort, in a certain way generates the cause of future becoming or birth and rebirth in the domain of Dukkha or Sansara. The Buddhist ethical view is by doing the unavailable act in a samyak way and, ends, and practice Arya Ashtanga Marga and have pancha nivaranas, one can dwell in the Brahma Viharas and be an Arhata or Bodhisattva to get the Nirvana. Purity of virtue leads to purity of view, then to purity of mind, unsettable freedom from the attachment and the mind. The whole gamut of Buddhist ethical value is to become an Arhata or Bodhisattva or a Nirvana and, and the ethics is Nirvana centricity. Ethics has Nirvana centricity. Well-being consists in, in accomplishing the nirvana. Thank you for listening from with compassionate heart, I like Buddha, Buddhist, and I expect for your inputs. Thank you all. Dr. Sarat, am I audible to all of you? Audible to me at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Dr. Saraj Kandakar was extensively discussed on the fundamental ethical notions initially, and then he goes on discussing about uh, some uh, significance of Buddhist ethical notions of Four Noble Truths. And uh, how the Buddhist ethical concepts derived from 
uh, the four noble truths. In course of his discussion, he has focused upon the early Buddhist concepts of conscious consciousness as a fundamental factor of forming the personality of an individual. Besides this, Dr. Kaur has discussed on the spiritual well-being of an individual that is Arhatva or the spiritual well-being of the from the holistic perspective that is Bodhisattva. And he has nicely discussed about the fundamental Buddhist notions of Anitattva, Anatattva, Dukkha and Jatushtattva. And how these three concepts are related to each other and they are responsible for the spiritual well-being of an individual and a society as well. In the second part of his lecture, he has focused upon the Buddhist ethical notions from some early Buddhist literature of Pali canon, like Dhamma Chakra Bhagavatana Sutta, Vishuddha Magga, and he has elaborately discussed about Brahma Vihara. Thank you, sir. Uh, so now our session is open for discussion. I request all of our participants to ask some questions if you have, and then we can discuss upon it. Madam, message box is a post no essay. Moitri was a good day. Sir, our student Moitri Goshami has asked a question. She has written that I want to know that the state of Nirvana is Nitya or Anitya. This is her question, sir. If you say something. The state of uh, the state of Nirvana is Nitya. The state of Nirvana is Nitya it's, or Anitya. Uh, the state of Nirvana is Nitya, but the thing is um, Nitya for what? Nirvana actually is blown out. Nirvana as the fire, as the fire or the lamp, uh, the fire in the lamp, the flame in the lamp is blown out. So Nirvana is like that, blown out. When it is got blown out, we can't say. After that, anything else. So, in sense, in that sense, nirvana is unspeakable. You can't say that it is nitya or anitya or anything else. Nirvana is unspeakable. But going behind that, you may say that if unspeakable, the fire is blown out and the materiality has blown out. Where has it gone? Okay, in the flame, in the in the form of flame, it has blown out. But in the other form, it, it is already there. Since the energy does not uh, does not go out, it, it only changes. So it goes to its nitya pure form. So nirvana is in that sense nitya. But in the primary sense, it is unspeakable. We can't speak or think of whether it is nitya or anitya. If you say it is nitya, there is a logical discordance. If you say it is in anitya, nitya or anitya, whatever we say, there will be difficulty. Logical difficulty. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, I have a question. No. Uh, can I ask you, sir? Yeah, yeah. We know that, sir, there is a fundamental difference between uh, Hinojanist and Mahajanist in interpretation regarding Pratitya Samutpannatva, but I am not going into its detail. But my question is, what is the reason of upholding Pratitya Samutpannatva in the Buddhist philosophical framework in general? In general, Pratitya Samutpada, Bhava Chakra, Sansara Chakra is the original thing. So that is that is accepted by all. Nobody denies that. Only the first century BC, Nagarjuna and Asubhasa, they started to understand it as the principle of causation. So from there it starts. But when, even if they start it, the Theravadins, the Hinojanis also accepted it as a principle of causation. But the primary sense uh, that Bhava Chakra, Janma Muttu Chakra, Janma Varana Chakra, the, it is also accepted simultaneously by all. Is it the general? My next question is, how is Pratit yes. is responsible for eradicating suffering? What is? Uh, how is Pratitya Samutpannatva is responsible for eradicating suffering? Um, that part I knowingly left because it is a very deeper thing. 
that uh, pratikta sanupatta is made causality causality is a factual concept factual order it is a factual thing it happens with the facts with the events but the ethical thing is uh, ethical thing means ethical value of our karma karma uh, thing karma is also factual and then karma uh, the impression of karma is factual so amassing the all the karma are also factual the all the things are factual causation factual and causation happens to work with the thing also factual so there is nothing logical here but when the factual is connected with the, uh, something other and uh, when connected with something other the connection makes uh, either good or bad so if it is good in the bad way it is makes sansara if it is connection makes a good way it is uh, it is nirvana so that is a pratikta samutpanna means one one action you have done and the result uh, the, the saskar it has created if it has created the uh, good saskar if it has created bad saskar then you are in the bad way in the sansara sansara if it created the good saskar you are in the bad way in the good way in the sanskara so if you have done in such a way that the saskar will not be created at all the sanskar will not be created at all the thing is the you have to set aside your ego there will be no ego egolessness and desirelessness if these two things are there egolessness and uh, desirelessness then according to pratikta samutpada there will be no further karma so there is a there is a way to the nirvana in easier way but uh, to get those uh, egolessness state of egolessness and the state of uh, desirelessness is very difficult sometimes we go up to the desirelessness but it is difficult to go to the egolessness but we have to go to that after that only all karma we do it will not be our karma in the gita you come to the same thing that uh, if you somebody will surrender krishna says if you surrender to me and you do your work then you are not working you are the instrument you have the instrumental um, capacity i am the actual real uh, agent you have no agent good so then karma's effect will not come to you it come karma's effect come to the god means the universal consciousness so when when some person will understand that uh, i am not the agent i am not the agent the agent is because of this cause and conditions the cause and conditional snare it makes me to work it makes me the work i am a bondage only i am a congregation of panchaskanda so in this sense there are egolessness and desirelessness then there is the nirvana and these are these are satisfied because of the pratikta samutpada since there is no karma there is no saskara since no saskara there is no becoming so nirvana okay sir thank you sir our last question is is the idea of pratikta samutpanna so metaphysical because we know that buddha himself was silent about certain metaphysical questions so my question is what is uh, the buddha was silent to the metaphysical questions Sorry, sir. Uh, now you are telling something I could not listen. Okay, sir. I am repeating it. Is the idea of pratyekta samutpanna to metaphysical? Because we all know that Buddha himself was silent. Buddha himself was silent about some metaphysical questions. So, what is the nature of this doctrine? I mean, pratyekta samutpanna to pratyekta samutpanna. So, but uh, but uh, why we should do we should use the Term pratikta samutpanna to. Why we should Sorry, use sir, the? Oh, why should we use the term pratikta samutpanna to? Pratikta samutpanna to or pratikta samutpanna to? The to the pratik the word to was discarded by Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna discarded every kind of to. To means substantiality. Pratikta samutpanna to means. Yes, to comes brings the substantiality, the sense of substantiality. Substantiality means permanence. Good quality, good quality. Yes, so it will go against this thing. So, pratikta samutpanna to. Uh, if you say that pratikta, to means sabto. Sabto means it, it it is something quality and it should be with some substance. If I say that the pen, pen is actually pencil, just like the pencil stand, the pen is the lead, is the pen, ink, the the pen. And this is cover. All these things makes the pen. So if I so I I will wonder for the sabto. I cannot find the sabto here. But this is the pratikta samutpanna to. Because this causal it is created. But that to is missing. If you missing because there is no substance here. If you make it uh, all the different different parts, 
then there is no choice. That is the Nagasena and that uh, that who is the who is the uh, Nagasena and uh, somebody else's uh, Pulinda. Pulinda and uh, Nagasena question answer. Who is the chariot? If you design other other parts of the chariot, there is no chariot. So chariot means uh, including all these things. University means including all the departments, buildings, students, everything. So this kind of things uh, composite words. Um, in Western philosophy, it is clarified more uh, that the composite words, those things, uh, are in, uh, are in, not are in here. We got like says that there is a, there is the composite when something com, com, uh, something common term given to some composite things, and that uh, something cannot be found to uh, in relation to the composite word. Because the library, you may say, library means some books and other things. It is described with by. Uh, Right? The library means the composite of other things. But if you design all other parts, you find, cannot find where is the library. Similarly, university cannot be found if all these parts will be differentiated. Pen you cannot be found. The subtle of the pen cannot be found if the, all the parts will be designed and destroyed. So that is why Patita Samutpannato means the quality of uh, getting, uh, getting created uh, depending upon others. Apart from that, there is nothing supposed to be And the other things in metaphysical questions, the everybody knows this is called a backrutas. A backrutas means it cannot be backrutas. Backrutas means it cannot be uh, explained uh, without going into logical riddles. If you explain, you will go inevitably to the logical riddles. That is why it is called a backrutas. And there are 14 questions regarding this whether Buddha will be. Driven or not, not driven. In the TRB Muthi uh, room uh, book, uh, there is a book called by TRB Muthi Central Philosophy of Buddhism. There it is very nicely described. Right. Right. It is nicely described these things, why it is not. And uh, if you do, then there is some difficulty. If you do not do, then there is some difficulty. If you say that the world is the universe is eternal, then there is some difficulty. If you say that it is not eternal, there is some difficulty. If you say both, then there is the contradiction. If you say neither, then there is also some other difficulty. So logical difficulties is there. If when there is speakability comes regarding the ultimate things, always there is something logical logical difficulties. That is why Wittgenstein says that whenever wherever you cannot say pass over in silence. It is in silence you have to realize it and understand. Then sometimes somewhere you, if you make a meditation on these questions, then these things will be better understood by you. But whenever you understand it, you cannot express it to other person. You can only understand experience. So even if your understanding will be something cringy, but that will be nearer to that. So similar things. So when in this context, Buddha, somebody asked Buddha, Ananda asked Buddha that that person was asking about the Atma, and you did not answer anything else. He thought that you are ignorant. And Buddha said that if you say that Atma, then he will understand in that 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 sense, not in the proper sense. If I say that there is no Atma, then he will understand in some other other person's versions, not in my version. So it is very difficult. That is why let him to only practice this meditation and he will realize it is experiential. Buddha's dharma is exper experimental and experiential. Not only Buddha's, whole total Indian philosophical systems, experiential. It is not only by reading. Reading is starting, teacher is starting, books is secondary, second and then vidyasana and then experience. So the experience we have to do, that person experiences and do. One person comes to the Buddha, I, ha I am a great pandit, if you give me the answers of my questions, then I shall follow you. Buddha said that I shall answer all your questions, but you have to do with my, do some condition, something in my condition. So that what is your condition? Now there is somebody, some follower, uh, Kasyapa, Purana Kasyapa. The Kasyapa is sitting in there inside uh, under the tree and making meditation. He will be a guru for next two years. After two years, you ask me any question, I shall answer. Then the learned Pandit Brahmin went to the custom that Buddha said that I said that I, I, I no need to say I understood. Then he said that you sit here and make your mind silent. After your body and senses and then mind is silent. He, he made like this. Initially he was feeling difficulty trying to show his Pandit and ask some questions, but he could not. Then he has also some query, original query, and he could not get satisfied. But slowly he tried to satisfy his guru, making him silent, 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 silent. And slowly he understood so many things, questions evaporating from his mind. He got the answers. Then after two years, Buddha went to him, should I answer, ask me questions, whatever you have. He said that I got all answers for my own questions. I don't need any so I don't need to ask. So this is the experimental things, experiential things. When experience happens, it will happen. It will be done. But um, naturally, uh, query will come in the conscious mind. 
and query coming in the conscious mind is the first good uh, mark, good sign that we are going in the right way. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for all your responses, sir. So now uh, I think there is no other question from our participants. So now may I request our head of the department, Dr. Devabrata Shaha, for delivering the formal vote of thanks to our speaker for today's lecture. Thank you, madam. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your valuable lecture. Uh, it is also useful and uh, will help us and our students to understand and realize the Buddhist ethical philosophy. Sir, you have explored the Buddhist philosophy from a new angle and analyzed Buddhist philosophy from an ethical point of view. Sir, your lecture opened a new vision to go research on Buddhist ethics. Thank you again, sir, for uh, for your virtual presence and thought-provoking lecture. Thank you, thank you all for inviting me and giving me a chance to deli make deliberation with you people. Thank you all. Namaskar. Namaskar, sir. Namaskar.